please join me in giving a very warm Forward 50 welcome to the Honorable Carla Qualtrough. Thank you. <laughs> oh, thank you so much. No, no pressure. Um, well, good morning, everyone. It's really a pleasure to be here. It's lovely to see Claudette here today. We're on the same circuit, I think. I feel so much joy and so much peace and calm after she's greeted us, so I appreciate that. Um, I would like to begin by acknowledging that we are gathered on the traditional unceded territory of the Algonquin people. I pay respect to their elders past and present and extend that respect to all other uh, indigenous people here today. So thank you for having us. Um, we have an excellent array of speakers and representatives from all over Canada and around the world here today. You're very fortunate. Um, many of you have traveled from far and away and wide, and we're excited to have you here today. This is a truly unique opportunity to learn from each other and to better understand the challenges and immense opportunities of tomorrow's digital advances. Technology is one of the ways we can break down barriers to accessibility and inclusion. Sorry, I'm trying to get rid of this. Um, making the delivery of programs and services simpler, less burdensome, and more accessible for government employees and for all Canadians is what we're constantly striving for. We ask ourselves how we can deliver IT services to government departments and agencies so they can better deliver services to Canadians. We ask ourselves how we can leverage technology to modernize our procurement processes to make it easier for companies like yourselves to do business with the Government of Canada. And we ask ourselves how we can strategically partner with the private sector to break down barriers to accessibility to create more opportunities for Canadians with disabilities and build a more inclusive society. As a person with a disability, you heard I have all these medals, yeah, whatever, um, I'm legally blind. I was born legally blind. I have about 10% corrected vision, which to give you some perspective means I can't see very much. 10% um, corrected, 5% uncorrected, but I've always had to navigate a world that at times wasn't really built for me. It didn't really meet my needs. And so innovations in technology were really important to me uh, as a kid and as a student because it allowed me to discover my world. My mom will tell you this really cute story where the first time I got a monocular, I discovered that birds had feet. Now, that was quite revolutionary to the four-year-old girl who had no idea birds had feet. I'm not sure what I thought they did when they were on the ground, like, but I was four. Um, but I also got to see a quarter under a closed caption TV, under a, and I realized that it said the word Canada on it. I had no idea that our coins had words on them. If you can imagine, this was like mind-woggling at the time. And these small things that you all may take for granted, I was only able to access because of technology. And after I retired as an athlete, I really wanted to pursue my education in political science and law. And as you can imagine, neither of those things are light on reading material. But imagine not being able to read most of it or have access to most of it. So my profs and I eventually would figure out how to get me the materials in an accessible format. But it was really through technology that everything became a little bit easier. Now, I'm dating myself here, but at the time, we all didn't have laptops in, in university, and I got a laptop. I was very popular, and this was cutting edge in law school. And I was literally the only one in my class who had a laptop. Um, but it really allowed me to keep up and pursue my legal education as barrier-free as possible at the time. Now, we've come a long way since then, um, but the more we can close the gap by removing barriers, the closer we move to a fully inclusive society. This is about encouraging everyone to take meaningful action to make our society more accessible and inclusive. I'm proud to say that our government is committed to achieving this broad culture change. It's foundational to the historical accessibility legislation that our government tabled last June. Bill C-81, the proposed Accessible Canada Act, will benefit all Canadians, especially Canadians with disabilities, through the realization of a barrier-free Canada. 
This will be achieved by proactively identifying, removing, and preventing barriers to accessibility wherever Canadians interact under areas of federal jurisdiction. And this proposed legislation has quite a wide reach. It applies to Parliament, the Government of Canada, Crown Corporations, and other federally regulated sectors and entities, including organizations in the transportation, telecommunications, broadcasting, and banking sectors. It ensures that, the, that these sectors and entities are inclusive from the start. By proactively addressing discrimination before it happens, people with disabilities can have an equal chance at success. And this is, the, this is the real underlying premise of the Accessible Canada Act. Sectors like procurement, IT, and AI will proactively implement accessibility measures to ensure all Canadians can use and access the same resources. So let me give you an example. As a human rights lawyer, it was very frustrating to me that our system is designed that we have to really wait till people are discriminated before we can help them. We have to wait till someone's denied a service, denied a program, denied access to something, and then the system just kicks in and says, probably two years later, you're right, you shouldn't have been denied that. Well, this act kind of backs that up, and it creates a system where the government takes on the burden of removing barriers so that we don't get to the point of discrimination. De plus, la loi donnera au gouvernement de Canada. In addition, the legislation will give the government of Canada the authority to work with partners, industries, and Canadians with disabilities to create new accessibility standards and regulations in areas of federal jurisdiction. This includes buildings and public spaces, transportation as well as information and communications technologies. The government has committed approximately $290 million over six years to make sure everything is in place to get this right. And as I've said before, this legislation represents a culture shift in the government's approach to accessibility. And as an advocate, I would tell you, this is the most significant advancement in disability rights since the Charter. I'd like to take a moment also to recognize the amazing private sector partners in the disability community. Some of you are here today, and I'd like to thank you for your ongoing support in developing and tabling Bill C-81. I'd also like to highlight the important role that business leaders are playing in this really, really important conversation. Last spring, I was in New York to attend the UN Conference of State Parties on the Convention of the Rights of People with Disabilities. And while there, I toured Microsoft's Technology Center which houses the latest innovative technologies in accessibility. I was thrilled to see the advances being made to support people with disabilities in the workplace. They truly live by the idea that technology is a tool for all people. And they build their project products to empower and help individuals achieve even more. Because of Microsoft, people across the world are able to be active members of society and participate in the workforce. This isn't just about accessing your email. It's about being a fully participating citizen. Like, this is about a right of citizenship. That's where we are on this right now. And that day, I really felt inspired about the potential that tech companies have to push boundaries for the greater good of people with disabilities. And I've begun to see a shift where businesses are understanding and seeing the return on investment when they have people with disabilities on their team or when they make their businesses more accessible. Perhaps what's driving this shift is the rise in awareness of the fact that people with disabilities and their families represent a purchasing power of goods and services of more than $210 billion annually. According to a study conducted by Employment and Social Development Canada, improvements to workplace access would allow 550,000 Canadians with disabilities to work more, increasing the GDP by $16.8 billion by 2030. And these are numbers that businesses can't ignore because it means that barriers to accessibility are also barriers to profit. If your business doesn't have access to 14% of the consumers, if your restaurant can't accommodate somebody in a wheelchair, then you are losing out on business, right? And as our population ages, we know that Companies that figure out that there is a strong business case for accessibility are going to reap significant rewards. So this isn't just the right thing to do. It's not just the law. 
and I encourage you all to do the right thing and follow the law. But this is, there's a really strong and significant business case for accessibility and inclusion. It's also why our government is putting our attention on hiring more people with disabilities, making our services more accessible, and removing barriers across Canada. We have companies who have labor shortages, significant labor shortages in this country, and guess what? I have an untapped labor pool waiting to be accessed. You know, notre programme de technologie accessible est une... Our accessible, a prime example is our accessible technology programme. It co-funds innovative projects that develop new assistive or adaptive technologies to improve access to the digital economy for persons with disabilities. With millions in dollars in funding available, this, this gives the private sector, not-for-profit organizations and research institutes a real opportunity a real opportunity to create long-lasting innovations that respond to the needs of Canadians with disabilities. To serve as excellence in today's digital world. It led us earlier this year to sign the Digital Charter, or the D7, joining leading digital nations in its shared mission to harness digital technology to the benefit of all citizens. The D7 is an excellent forum to share best practices and collaborate on common projects and service improvements. Here in Canada, we feel that we have much to share. We have worked hard to keep pace with technological changes in order to better serve our citizens. And I can tell you that we're proud to see Canada rank first in the International Civil Service Effectiveness Index last year. Now, those of us who have worked with you all weren't surprised at all to see that. But at the same time, we know how much work remains, which is why our government has made significant investments to ensure we are properly resourced to address evolving IT needs and opportunities. In our last federal budget, we committed $2.2 billion to continue to build a modern, secure, and reliable IT foundation for the digital delivery of programs and services to Canadians. Much of this work is led by Shared Services Canada, the government's IT agency. Today, Shared Services Canada is undertaking a very large and diverse whole-of-government IT transformation. Using enterprise-wise approaches, the department is harnessing today's latest technologies to support mission-critical operation and enable digital services to Canadians. Let me just go over a few elements that I'm particularly excited about. We're seeing better coordination between government departments and agencies, which is allowing them to address technology needs without duplicating platforms or creating incompatible systems. We're seeing fewer barriers for government-wide decision-making and better use of resources. Aujourd'hui, le tableau qui prend forme est très différent. Today, the picture that is taking shape is much different. A prime example is our ability to appropriately manage cyber activity with a much better overall view of government networks and security systems, Canada is in a much better place to res respond to common cyber threats, such as the meltdown and space vulnerabilities from uh, earlier this year that put sensitive information at risk. The back office. This is the sexy part. Um, it kind of is. Um, this includes closing down dozens of old legacy data centers and migrating applications to public cloud services and state-of-the-art enterprise data centers that provide greater physical security for the personal information of Canadians. I shouldn't mock that, should I? Sorry. In addition, we continue to establish enterprise-wide IT agreements with leading technology companies and suppliers. In areas like supercomputing, for example, we've partnered with industry leaders to provide Canadians with one of the most advanced weather services in the world. Our government also recognizes that we must do more to facilitate the broader adoption of new and emergency, emerging technologies. It's what Canadians really expect of their government. That's why we're engaging experts, industry professionals, and civil society to explore how we can use the latest technological developments to better serve Canadians. Take the rise of artificial intelligence, for example. Our government wants to be at the forefront when it comes to levering technologies like AI. In fact, we're establishing a source list of pre-qualified suppliers to provide artificial intelligence products, solutions, and services for all the Government of Canada's needs. 
This source list is designed to provide a space for all suppliers, including small and medium enterprise, to do business with our government. And that's one example of how we're leveraging emergency, emerging technologies. These initiatives will help us be the modern government that Canadians deserve. But it's all, not only about procuring the latest technologies, it's about fundamentally modernizing the way in which we procure our goods and services in the first place. We've heard from you, I'd say pretty much everybody, about the need to simplify government processes. And I'm determined to build and create a world-class procurement system that meets everyone's needs. I recognize that many small businesses, many suppliers, um, surprise, often find it difficult to work with government. You, we've been told that there are too many rules and barriers that prevent companies from doing business with us. And that's why we're moving towards an outcomes approach. And what does that really mean? Well, it means that a greater focus will be put on the problem or situation we're trying to address. It means getting away from prescribing a series of steps that we believe will yield a certain result, or even presuming we know the best solution. The more agile approach reduces this re the reliance on large RFPs that take weeks to complete. It also will allow us to better engage with industry to address the challenges at hand, letting industry provide suggestions on what they can offer rather than predefining solutions. On peut observer cette approche dans notre nouveau défi. This approach can be seen in our new Phoenix Innovation Challenge. Phoenix? Oh, right? <laughs> Nous examinons tous les aspects de we are examining all aspects of the HR to pay environment, including a review of all systems and processes involved in the end-to-end -end chain. The goal is to stabilize operations and lower the queue of outstanding transactions awaiting processing. In this case, we are seeking innovative solutions, both internally and externally, to specific issues being encountered, new ways to process pay, to modify and adapt pay business models, to achieve better pay results and deliver better services. However, we know that we also need to steer the process with modern tools. The fact is, for far too long, our procurement processes have been more or less, less paper-based. It's boggled my mind. Um, and I'm intent on changing that. <laughs> Thank you. Last year, Public Services and Procurement Canada started to accept bids electronically, a faster, greener, and more efficient way of doing businesses. This was a big deal. Like, it sounds silly, but it really was a big deal for us. And this is another big deal. We've actually managed to establish an email notification service for suppliers, allowing them to sub subscribe to emails which alert them to new tender notices in areas of interest. And to date, we've had over 7,200 users, uh, suppliers registered for procurement alerts. In doing this, we've increased access and competition, and businesses are using fewer resources trying to figure out business opportunities with the Government of Canada. And this seems like a small, simple initiative. It's really proving immensely helpful to businesses of all sizes. When you consider the fact that procurements for the Government of Canada total approximately $25 billion a year, the impact of these simple improvements becomes really, really clear. And this is important to us. Moving procurement online is a key priority to improving the way government works with suppliers to buy and sell goods and services. That's why we included an investment of $196 million in this year's budget to establish a new e-platform for simpler, better procurement. In July, we awarded the contract for this platform, and I'm happy to say the work on this project is already underway. This interactive, cloud-based platform will facilitate an online experience something similar to an Amazon or an eBay, which allows buyers and, let's see who else, um, suppliers to work together on one platform from proposal to final payment. This is a really, really big deal. Elle aidera également à promouvoir la participation d'entreprises canadiennes. It uh, will also help small and medium-sized uh, companies uh, to uh, take play a role in this. And 
it is by streamlining these processes and by using high-tech uh, new technologies that we will improve uh, the procurement process. For the risk that as we become more digital, that we're going to leave people behind if we don't consciously choose to be inclusive in the way we do things. But, as I've already told you, our government is committed to building an accessible Canada for all. And that commitment extends to how our government procures goods and services. That's why I'm actually very pleased to announce today that we're creating an accessible procurement resource centre to ensure that our goods and services that are purchased by the government of Canada can be used by Canadians with disabilities without the need for adaptation or specialised design. As the country's largest public purchaser of goods and services, we have a real opportunity here to make a societal impact. What if we just decided that we wouldn't buy software that everybody couldn't use? Instead of buying something and then realizing that many of our citizens and employees can't use it and then paying a lot of money to adapt it and then it still really doesn't meet everybody's needs. And this is a fundamental kind of policy shift in how we procure. And it will serve two functions, the Accessible Procurement Resource Centre. First, it will maintain and create a list of commodities across government for which accessibility is relevant. And second, it will provide direction, guidance and advice on accessible procurement to all federal organizations. And this is about ensuring accessibility from the start, as I said, because meeting the needs of the people we serve should never be an afterthought. I believe, I truly believe, that our collective duty to make sure that all citizens are included and thriving in today's world will make our planet, our society better. Ensemble, nous pouvons jeter des bases solides afin de... Today, we can lay down the groundwork to ensure that accessibility and inclusion are drivers that make our institutions a 21st century. By achieving a significant uh, digital transformation, we will, in co collaboration, be leaders in Canada in the digital area and be able to promote uh, a change in culture. We must ensure that these new systems and technologies are truly inclusive. For disability rights, I'm proud of the work our government is doing right now to make our services more accessible and inclusive, and I've touched on a few examples here today. There are many others, including the leading-edge work departments like Shared Services Canada are doing to assist and integrate employees with disabilities into the workplace, and so many other things. So I guess what my message to you today is, I, is pretty straightforward. We can only have true success if we, government and industry together, lead by example and help lift the voices up of everyone. And I'm optimistic because I tend to be optimistic, um, but I'm also optimistic because I've seen firsthand how technology can break down barriers. And I've seen how technology can help create opportunities for people who struggle. And I'm a living, breathing example of that. And I hope you can join me in creating an inclusive and accessible Canada for all. Open your minds to the possibilities of how what you're talking about today can really make a difference for a lot of people for whom we've kind of not really made a difference in the past. Thank you very much.